Hey, can you just give it up for this worship and this tech team um, for leading us each and every Sunday? Man, you guys do an incredible, incredible job. Well, church, my name's Austin. Uh, I'm on the team here, and on occasion, uh, when Trevor's out, I get the opportunity uh, to share with you. And when I share with you, man, I do not take it lightly. Um, this space here in which Trevor has been teaching from and preaching from and laboring from for over a decade um, at this point. And um, if you've sat under his teaching for any amount of time, you know not only what a gifted teacher he is, uh, but the deep impact that he's had on your life. And so even as he will probably um, listen to this podcast later, can we show him some audio honor and just say, Trevor, thank you um, for teaching and preaching and leading so faithfully. Well, if you're here this morning and you've been here for 30 years or you've just simply been with us for the first time for 30 minutes, we're simply a, a church with a grand vision, a vision of a Los Angeles in which every single person, no matter how old or how young, has experienced the life-changing power of the gospel. I mean, that is the good news of the gospel, is that it is not just information for us. It's actually deep, deep transformation within us. And so there's three things we just want to be really excellent about. First is, man, we want to know Jesus. We want to make Jesus the center of everything that we do. And we think that as we seek to know Jesus better, we will actually begin to grow in our faith, putting more of our trust, more of our hope, more of our allegiance in Jesus. And as we do that, he does begin to change us. He does begin to transform us. And we become the kinds of people that go out into the world to serve. We serve better in our homes, serve better in the workplace, serve better in our schools and in our neighborhoods. And so this morning, we're continuing um, our series on 1 Timothy. In our previous series, before 1 Timothy, uh, we talked about the Holy Spirit descending and really filling the church and what it looks like to be filled, empowered, baptized by the Holy Spirit, for the church to be sent out, filled with the Holy Spirit. And so as we look into 1 Timothy, we're looking at one of these first century Holy Spirit-filled churches, and as a spirit-filled church, how they ought to act and conduct themselves. And as we finish this series, we'll kind of throw it all the way back to the beginning, back to Genesis. Uh, but in the meantime, Paul, as he writes this letter to Timothy, one of his protégés, he makes it really, really clear as to why he's writing. This is not just a journal entry of Paul's. But as he writes to Timothy, he says, man, Timothy, there's, there's really three things I'm looking to accomplish in this letter. First is that you would be the kind of person that lives an orderly life. Paul tells Timothy, watch the way that you live. Secondly, he says, and also not just the way you live, but watch your doctrine. Think orderly thoughts. And finally, he starts giving instructions to Timothy about how the church ought to worship and function in an orderly way. So Paul wants Timothy to, to live and to think orderly and for the, the church that Timothy oversees to, to worship and, and function in an orderly way. And so this week we'll be in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. Again, it's 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. You can flip there if you have your smartphone Bible or your paperback Bible. And as you flip there, um, Paul's going to be talking about three things. He's going to talk about elders. He's going to talk about deacons. He's going to talk about Christ. And so we're going to notice three things as Paul writes this section to Timothy. One is that elders are, by God's grace, remarkably unremarkable. And deacons, by God's grace, are remarkably useful. And Christ is remarkably unrivaled. Elders, remarkably unremarkable. Deacons, remarkably useful. And Christ, remarkably unrivaled. But I want to I start with this. I do miss my days in elementary school. Times were a bit simpler then, and 
dreams may have been even larger than at times. And you know, I love one of the questions you get asked early on, as early as the first grade, what do you want to be when you, when you grow up? And then just about every boy in that class was like, man, I'm going to be a professional athlete, right? You have these grand visions, but it could have been a professional athlete. It could have been a firefighter. It could have been a policeman, all kinds of things. But what the teacher is really kind of nudging you to do is to aspire to something, to set your eyes towards something, to kind of see this kind of occupation or this vocation that you would grow into. As we begin this section, Paul is telling Timothy that people in the church ought to be doing the same thing, that they ought to aspire to something, to set their eyes into being a certain kind of person and grow into that. And so this is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says this, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone sets their eyes on, if anyone aspires to, if anybody wants to grow into the office of being an overseer, overseer is the same word for elder, same word for pastor. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a good thing. He desires a noble task. And so then Paul is going to say, if you want to aspire to this, if you want to set your eyes on this, if you want to grow into this, there are qualifications. You have to train into this kind of a role. And so he goes on a list of qualifications. This is verse 2. Therefore, an overseer, elder, pastor, must be above reproach. I mean, their, their conduct ought to not make people around them recoil. They ought to be the husband of one wife. In other words, they ought to be faithful in their marriage covenant. They ought to be sober-minded. Earlier in Timothy, he talks about folks kind of uh, being obsessed with things like genealogies and myths. And he says, no, I just want you to be sober-minded on doctrine. Have a steady, sound mind, not kind of chasing myths and genealogies. Be self-controlled. In other words, they don't have a They don't have a hot head. Be respectable. When they walk into a room, they're they're stately. They're kind. They're patient with people. Be hospitable, willing to receive people in public spaces, whether it's, hey, come sit with us, or simply to receive people into their home. The door's kind of always open. Able to teach. In other words, they have enough grasp of doctrine that over a coffee at a Starbucks, they're able to teach someone who's newer to the faith about doctrine. And that space can grow into smaller groups and onward. But able to teach. Number three, not a drunkard. In other words, they're able to drink in moderation if they decide to drink. Not violent, but gentle. Not starting arguments and being quarrelsome, but taming their tongue. Not a lover of money. In other words, they are generous. Verse 4, he must manage his household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. In other words, training up his children in the way of the Lord. Verse 5, for if someone does not know how to manage his household, how will he care for God's household or God's church? In other words, there's this, it gets bigger, right? Manage your own life well. Then manage your house well. And if you can manage your life well and your house well, you begin to grow in this role of being able to help oversee God's house well because God's house is the gathering of households to worship God together. He continues, he must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. Outsiders kind of see his life and say, man, I don't know a lot about him, but man, I think, I think really well of that guy and the way I see him work, the way I see him treat customers, the way I see him treat his kids and his wife when they come into the space. Verse 7, he must be thought well by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace or into the snare of the devil. Now, I love this exercise that a mentor of mine uh, when I was younger, he was, he was a pastor, a mentor of mine, um, would kind of have me think about, right? And he would say, um, hey, Austin, I want you to think of the five most impactful 
sermons you've ever heard. And I thought about it for five seconds, and then ten seconds, and then a minute. And I thought to myself, man, I've heard a lot of sermons. I don't know that I remember any of them. <laughs> and then he said, I want you to think of the five people that have most impacted your life. This was a little easier. I know, okay, this person, that person. Okay, I think I've got about five people that have had a good impact on my life. And then he said, I want you to, so you've got those five people. Um, are any of them famous? Are any of them Brad Pitt? Are any of them LeBron James? Are any of them any kind of celebrity that people would know? My response was, no. People like my dad. People like my mom. People like one of my pastors or a friend of mine's parents. They were very just kind of, they're very ordinary people. The kinds of people that history will not write about in the future. And the odds are, if you go to that same exercise, you think about the five sermons that have most impacted your life, you're going to have a hard time remembering. If you think about the five people that have impacted your life, you can probably think of them now. And for most of you, it's not George Clooney. It's that elementary school teacher. It's that parent. It's that pastor. It's these people that have made insane marks on our life that history ultimately will not Remember, I say that because Paul is talking about the same kinds of people when he talks about this office of overseer, elder, pastor. Not looking for wildly famous or wealthy people. Just people that live these very common, ordinary, unremarkable lives but leave deep impacts on our lives. Notice this. Paul does not say this. He does not say, therefore, an overseer elder must be perfect. They must have a master's degree in theology. They must operate in all of the gifts of the Spirit. They must have the entire Bible memorized. They must be wealthy, be famous, and be really, really good looking. (laughs) Paul doesn't say any of those things. In fact, a a kind of a famous, well-known scholar, D.A. Carson, when he kind of comments on this passage, he says, um, the qualifications for being uh, an elder are remarkable for being unremarkable. The qualifications to be an elder are remarkable for being unremarkable. Can you keep your temper? Can you be faithful to your spouse? Can you not love money and be generous? You kind of read through it. and It's these very unremarkable qualifications but are so refreshing to us when we meet somebody like that. And that's why on the path to faith and discipleship to Jesus, why it becomes so important for us to set aside things like worldly ambition for the sake of titles and prestige and fame. Why it's so important for us to put aside trying to live loud lives and have the most followers on social media and make sure that all of our Facebook friends know our opinion on whatever's trending. It's why it's so important, as Paul says elsewhere, to make it your ambition just to live a quiet life, an unassuming life. And so one of the questions I have for us this morning is, um, how unremarkable are you aiming to make your life? How quiet and faithful and simple and consistent are you aiming to make your life? So that's the first point. When Paul talks about elders, he talks about how by God's grace, how remarkably unremarkable they are. Then he continues in verse 8. So we got this office of elders, and then we have these deacons. He says, deacons likewise is very similar to elders in many ways, likewise must be dignified, stately, respectable, not double-tongued, not saying one thing to some people and some things to another, not receiving something in confidence here and spitting it out as gossip over there. 
not addicted to much wine. Again, if they decide to drink, they drink in moderation. They're not greedy for dishonest gain. They're hard workers, but they're not greedy for dishonest gain. Verse 9, they must hold to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. There's a little bit, a little bit of a push on them. Let them serve as deacons as if they prove themselves to be blameless. Verse 11, their, their wives, likewise, must be dignified, respectable, stately, not slanderers. They have control of their tongue. And also sober-minded, not getting caught up in genealogies and myths and astrology. Faithful, faithful, consistent in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife. Again, there's this fidelity to marriage that's really important. Managing their children and their households well. Verse 13, for those who serve well as deacons, they gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. There's kind of this office of elder that is designed to be people that just serve really well. In fact, that Greek word for deacon can also be just translated Servants. This is what servants in the church look like. It's one of the reasons why, or one of the things I love most about serving with this church week in and week out is we have a phenomenal group of people that when they show up at 7.50 in the morning, they're just saying, man, I'm willing to do anything, everything, and sometimes stand around waiting for people doing nothing. And it's incredible because when people kind of show up to do really what would seem like small tasks, like run cables in this room, or put together play gates in our wiggle room, or make coffee and wait five minutes for it to brew, set up banners on the fence or A-frames, if you were to look at everybody, it just looks like, man, we're just all serving this church together here on Sunday morning. And what's incredible is at times we have CEOs serving next to students. We have single folks serving next to families that have three, four, five kids. We have people that have just entered the marketplace or people that are just looking for a job serving alongside people that are deep into their careers. We have young, new believers serving next to people that have been following Jesus for 30 40, 50 years. If you were to show up on a Sunday morning, while we don't have fully established this office of deacon just yet, we have many people deaconing. We have many people just serving the church. No matter their status Monday through Saturday, when they show up on Sunday, how can I help? What can I do? Where can I serve? It's an, it, it's an incredible group of people. And so if you're not serving on a team yet, man, I would encourage you, go to rc.link. Fill out that form to serve because you will serve alongside incredible people that will invest into you and that you will be able to invest into. Shameless plug. Deacons are folks that serve well. I, I want to wrap up this kind of deacons are remarkable for being useful section with this, uh, this quote by T.L. Johnson. I'm a New Testament scholar. And again, like D.A. Carson, he's commenting on these qualifications for the office of elder and the office of deacon, which are deeply similar in many ways. And uh, when commenting on this list, he says, um, fidelity to one's spouse, sobriety and hospitality. They may seem like trivial virtues, to those that identify authentic faith with these momentary conversions. In other words, these, these big moments of baptism or these big moments of turning to the Lord. And dot, dot, dot. But to those that have lived a little longer, finding a leader that is truly a lover of peace and not a lover of money can be downright exciting. In other words, these very unremarkable spaces, these very mundane, consistent, faithful spaces 
actually make us exciting to other people. Wow. Look at how faithful they are to their spouse. Wow, look at the way they raise their kids. Wow, look at the way they're so consistent in their faith. Look at how when they go out, if they decide to drink, they don't drink too much. Look at how much they don't love money. They're so generous. And so the question for us is, are you willing to serve the church, no matter your status or role, Monday through Saturday? Are you willing to serve the church doing anything, everything, and nothing? But I have two cautionary tales about this. First is, um, if you are one of these people that is always serving, you're serving every single week in a space, let me encourage you, you need rhythms of not serving. You need rhythms of rest. If you're deaconing every single week, chill out. It's one of the reasons why here we have people serve every other week. We want to make sure people are getting rest. And it's important. You know, it's, it's that moment where one of the disciples, he's, Jesus is washing his feet. He says, no, 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 no. I, you should not be washing my feet. Let me serve you and wash your feet. And he says, dude, unless you let me serve you, you just have no part with me. There is an element to the Christian life in which we need to make ourselves available to be served. Also be aware of this. Um, if you're never serving with us, if you're never available to serve with us, come serve with us. Come hop on a rotation. Come do something as simple as greeting people at the coffee table, helping us set up the wiggle room, running cables in here. If you've got a gift or a talent for music, get in touch with Jens. We'd love to have you serve with us. We're not going to burn you out. We're not going to wear you out. But we're going to give you opportunity and space to serve. So that's the second point. Deacons are remarkably useful to the church by God's grace. And this is the final point. Christ is remarkably unrivaled. Paul, it's so interesting. Paul is, like the last chapter and a half, he's talking about orderly worship in the church. He's talking about things like teaching and elders and deacons, and it all sounds kind of... um, mundane-ish or formal-ish or organizationally-ish, which I love organizational stuff. But on the tail end of talking about qualifications for deacons, watch this. Verse 14 says, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. In other words, everything he's writing is when you show up to a household of God, this is how the household of God ought to be organized and behaving. Which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Verse 16, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. And he breaks into this wild, mysterious confession, creed, doxology. And your Bible probably has it kind of a, in a different kind of formatting in your text to note to you that this is kind of this old creed. It has a rhythm, a, a, a kind of cadence to it. It says, he was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the entire world, and then taken up into glory. In other words, when the church comes to teach, and to learn. When the church has elders and deacons, it's to guard, protect, and echo this mystery of the faith, which is Christ. It's not just to grow numbers on a Sunday. It's not just to establish a holy huddle of people that are your best friends. But it's to week in and week out proclaim this great mystery. In other words, elders and deacons are given qualifications that are both unremarkable and deeply useful. Why? Because there's no qualification they could hold above the qualifications listed that would even allow them to hold a candle to the greatness of Christ. There's nothing that someone could do above and beyond what these qualifications are. No title, 
no amount of money, no job occupation, no political office that at the end of the day would help you to say, I've done something great. When compared to Christ, it all pales in comparison. The book of Revelation paints a little bit of a picture of this. This is the book of Revelation. And John is kind of having this revelation. Um, and he's kind of hearing this voice. And I'm, I kind of, I'm condensing this a little bit for brevity. It says, and the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, meaning it was loud and blasting through the air, said, come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. Verse 2, at once in the spirit, I was there and behold, I stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. There's one throne and there's one seated on the throne. Verse 3, and he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carmelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of emerald. And around the throne there were 24 thrones, and seated on those thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. It is kind of this royal picture for these 24 elders. They get thrones and crowns and some nice clothing. Verse 10, and then the 24 elders got off their throne, and they just fell down before him who was seated on the throne, and they worshiped him who lives forever. And whatever crown they had been given, they threw it off of their head at his feet, casting down their crowns before that throne, saying, Dude, worthy are you, Lord and God, to receive glory, to receive honor, to receive power. For you are the one that created all things, and by your will they existed and they were created. In other words, when all this kind of comes to an end, and elders and deacons and sinners and saints are all gathered around the throne of God, it doesn't matter what status, what title you had here, everyone is face down worshiping God, throwing down their crowns, saying, nobody rivals you. Nobody compares to you. Nobody can stand before you. The church is structured and organized in this kind of unique way to show off the mystery of Christ, the unrivaledness of Christ, which causes us to remember the gospel as we come to the table of communion this morning. Um, And so even right now, I want to invite those that are serving communion to come forward. Um, and here's, here's kind of the gospel as it kind of makes sense of, you know, in this passage. Um, we are creatures, right? Revelation talks about this moment um, in which it is Christ that created all things and everything exists because of him. You exist because of God. You are not here by accident, but you were created by God. And even though we have been created by God, we have not lived our lives above reproach. We have not always been sober-minded. We have not always been self-controlled. We have not always conducted ourselves in a respectable way. We have not always been hospitable, sober, gentle, quiet, generous, or faithful with the things that God has given us. But Christ is the one who has. Christ, God made flesh incarnate into the world, is the one that lived a life above reproach, sober-minded, self-controlled till the end. Respectable, hospitable, sober, gentle, quiet, generous, and faithful with everything God had entrusted to him. Through God's design, this one who was, who was righteous, who actually lived properly, became as one who was not righteous, died on a cross in your place, in my place, in our place, that we, when we come before God, we might actually be seen as having been righteous. So this morning, by God's invitation, you can be forgiven. And so consider this as we come forward to take communion this morning. That's why it can be said of Christ. And this is simply 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. 
Christ was manifested in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the entire world, and taken up into glory. When we come to the table of communion, we come knowing that it is this famous one that is known all over the globe that died in our place that we might be forgiven. So this morning, I want to invite you to come forward, receive the elements, and um, hold on to them, and we'll come back up and take them together.